So I'm here with five lovely colleagues and Rob Hopkins from Transition and our eight storytellers. And so we're going to surround you in a blizzard of stories about where children and young people are flourishing today. We've asked each of these story takers to take as their starting point our call for spaces for liberated learning. We hope you've had a chance to see this and may even have printed it out to have it beside you now. Before we introduce ourselves and all of them, we're going to take a moment for us all to listen to this quietly and slowly once all together in this space. As you listen to the call, begin to settle into this moment. Allow yourself to relax. Okay. Notice the words that draw you in. And at the end, we will leave a minute or so to pause before continuing. A Call for Spaces of Liberated Learning by Gabrielle Arrange and Emily Dowdswell Designed by Suzanne Jezelik, 2021 The possibility of pockets of resistance to old conventions in schooling has been for a long time the focus of discussions between activists, artists, and educators. Treating the idea of a classroom lightly has allowed educators to listen more closely and pay greater attention to what children are exploring. Children develop their own languages of learning when given opportunities to use found materials freely and inhabit loosely choreographed spaces with ample time to roam and return. What if children can traverse infinite open-ended learning environments, spaces where the sharing and exchange of simple materials and carefully calibrated provocations could lead to utterly joyous outcomes? What if we focused on how children engage across multiple realities without expecting them to fit into the envelopes of experience that crystallized systems dictate, where impermanent, asymmetrical and unmanaged forms of learning that resist instruction can instead become productive? What if our systems allowed all children to flourish in infinitely wonky, beautifully different and communally crafted open-ended environments, particularly forests, fields, and unruly artscapes. We have seen how these spaces reject hierarchy and facilitate generosity, where children gather together and continuously amplify the acoustics of their landscape, wherever and whatever it is. Expansive, open-ended environments for wonder and exploration offer intimate spaces where one can be simultaneously lost and found, challenged and nurtured, and liberated and supported. Never has it been more important to create these spaces for all children. Now, we invite you to collect your thoughts and come back to this shared space. The words you have just heard were crafted by Gabby and Emily, who are here back in 2021. They went back to a group of colleagues who'd been part of organising a conference here in Cambridge, but also in Bath and other cities in the UK 17 years ago. This was based around the 100 Languages of Children exhibition from Reggio in Northern Italy, over 2,000 educators came from across the east of England and visited the exhibition, and we gathered their reflections and questions. And this became our first publication, The Enemies of Boredom. It hugely influenced our work with children and their communities. And this follow-up exercise by Gabby and Emily was without doubt the most ambitious long-term evaluation exercise we've ever attempted. We wanted to hear from these organizers and they were artists, researchers, teachers, professionals working in the heritage and art sectors, what still resonated about this work, what they still wanted to shout about and keep central to debates about helping children flourish. 
Since publishing this in the summer of 2021, we've worked as a group of colleagues to share it as widely as possible in Westminster and at events and through our own networks. But we also want to make the links between these networks more visible and invite others to join. We think of ourselves as creative activists and spend time when we meet up telling each other about the amazing pockets of resistance we know are going on against all the odds. We feel how this energises us to keep fighting for children's rights and wanted to share some of this energy with you all here tonight. I need to say a big thank you to the transition community who inspired this idea with their own blizzard of story events earlier this year. I personally found it very uplifting. And this is why all your donations that you've paid tonight will be going direct to fund their fabulous work. I met Rob, who's here with us back in 2018 when he was writing his book, which I've got here to wave, and have found his optimism, energy and passion really inspiring and infectious. We're going to introduce ourselves now as the group who've organised this evening before we move on to hearing from our eight storytellers. We're going to run this as a blizzard, going straight from one to the next without pausing. We want to wash you in the words we help, we'll fill you with joy and send you away with a skip in your steps. We've asked Rob to offer a few reflections after the last one, and then we expect to have some time for some chat too before we finish by 7.30. To introduce ourselves, we thought we'd use a format we've played with before when we share the call. And we'd love you to do this too in the chat if you can. There's quite a lot of it in the room, so sadly we can't all go around and introduce ourselves. But if everybody could use this format to introduce themselves in the chat, that would be lovely. So I'm going to start us off. My name is Ruth. I think today, above all, above all else, I am a lover of autumn colours. And the three words from the call that particularly resonate with me tonight as I listen to it are wonky, roam, and return. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabby, and welcome. Um, I am, among many other things, a paperclip preservationist, as you can see on my collar. Um, and the three words that I am holding on to this evening from the call are unruly, possibility, and generosity. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emily, and I am, amongst other things, an incorrigible time optimist. Tonight, the three words that I'm holding on to from the core are beautifully lost and found. Hello. You're on mute, Esther. We wondered how many times we'd have to do that, didn't we? Sorry. <laughs> My name's Esther, I'm a skateboarder. And the three words from the call that I'm sitting with tonight are resisting instruction in infinitely wonky spaces. And I know that was five, and that's because I'm resisting instruction. <laughs> Beautiful. Hello, everyone. I'm Penny. I'm an artist, a creative activist, and I'm in love with fields, forests and freedom. Rob, over to you. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Rob from Transition Network, and lovely to be here. I'm, I, uh, I, I love other people, infinitely wonky spaces. It's making me realize that a lot of my life is basically a pursuit for infinitely wonky spaces. And it's lovely to have some words put to something I never quite had the phrase for before. So thank you so much for that. And I pass, I don't know where it goes next. Susan. Susan. Over to you. Hello. I'm Susan, as it says on my name label, and um, I'm an art activist. I am a champion for art education in particular. Um, I have three words in my head that are there all the time, which is never stop trying. And that's me finished. Brilliant. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. I hope everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves in the chat if they want to, but do carry on doing that as the as you start listening to the stories. So 
over to you, Susan, because I think you're going to introduce. Um... Yes, my first speaker tonight is Mandy Barrett, um, who is a colleague and a friend. And Mandy works as the art lead at Gomersal Primary School, which is in a place called Cleckheaton in West Yorkshire. And tonight, Mandy's going to tell you about the unseen impact you have as an artist educator in the classroom. Over to you, Mandy. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mandy, and I have the absolute privilege of teaching art full time to primary age children. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got there and kind of the impact that it makes, both kind of the seen impact and the unseen impact. Um, I've been teaching now for 20 years. Um, teaching's a bit of a strange space to be in at the moment, um, and it hasn't always been that way. And I suppose I'm one of the lucky members of staff who have been in it for long enough to know that there is a different side to it. Um, I trained at Breton Hall University, um, graduated 20 years ago, and I've always worked at Gummersall Primary School, uh, which has been a very different place over the last 20 years. Um, so much so that I've worked through all the different key stages, the different year groups, and now have the absolute privilege of being in charge of my own dedicated art room space. Um, and the children come to me every week for a whole morning or a whole afternoon of just pure art time that isn't interrupted by anything else. Um, the phonics, the maths, the the endless testing just does not happen in our space. And you can feel that sense of release and relief when the children walk into the room. And it's just so wonderful. And like I said, an absolute privilege in our school that we have that space where children can come and, and just be themselves. Um, and this happened, you know, quite by accident. We were a first school and we closed down as a first school and gained year five and six children and opened up as a brand new school um, in a middle school site, which had a purpose built art studio. So it was just being in the right place at the right time. And as a school, we needed something, something very, very different. Uh, morale was low due to Ofsted. Um, you know, the children were very different. Um, it, it was an interesting place to be at that time. Um, and so nine years ago, setting up a dedicated art room and being able to work with children, develop their oracy, develop creativity, just to have that pure time where children can come and be themselves has really, really impacted our school beyond measure. Um, a lot of people ask how we manage to fit it into the timetable, and the answer is we we do. Um, so yeah, a full morning or a full afternoon every single week, and being able to dedicate that time, that space, that energy to um, allow the children to develop and flourish as artists. It's not about ticking boxes. It's not about you know looking spandangly and good on Twitter. It's about purely being there for the children giving them time, giving them space, giving them the resources, allowing them to ask questions, allowing them to use sketchbook space and develop, um, really brings our children out. Um, they're artists, I am their artist educator. It's not teacher and student, where we're all artists in our room. Um, and our, our children have been to Westminster. They've talked in the House of Parliament uh, through invitation from Susan to an APPG meeting where the children stood up and said to the MP, stop testing us, stop, you know, too much maths and too much English and core subjects and core subjects and allow us to be free and allow us to have time to create because it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. And the way our school has changed and developed over the last eight, nine years has been absolutely incredible. And a lot of that has been very visual. If you walk into our building now, art is just dripping off the walls. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, the children are so confident. They're, they're excited to talk about their art opportunities. Um, and that's the impact that you see all the time, which makes me so proud. I've you know got to the space now where I, I adore my job absolutely adore it which is just an absolute privileged space to be in um but there's also the unseen there's the impact that you make without always knowing it and i want to share um a letter that when i first read it, it just had me in pieces absolute pieces so as teachers you know we don't get the spandangly bonuses that bankers get at the end of the year we, we get a wonderful box of maltesers and often gorgeous written letters of thanks and prayers from parents which is priceless absolutely priceless but what shocked me this year beyond anything was I received 
a painting through the post and the most beautifully written letter from a student who left us two years ago. So B, would you mind holding it up for me? Sir, it says, Dear Mrs Barrett, I wanted to thank you, not only for being one of my absolute favourite teachers throughout primary school, but for being the one who introduced me to the concept of art and opening a door to all the things that this means. And now I look back, I realise that the reason that I have got the skills and the genuine interest in the creation and meanings and interpretation of artwork was from you and all the times that we spent in your lessons in the art room. The way that I can now look at art has helped me sincerely with my progress, which I hope will continue. So, I do hope that there are meanings with you personally in this piece of artwork I have sent for you, but I thought it would be nice for me to let you know some of my own intentions and meanings behind this piece of artwork. The overall picture was meant to represent my own narrow interpretation of what artwork was in my own head at a certain time, which is the colourless dark side, and then the more colourful and alive side shows how much your lessons have absolutely changed my view of the whole world and the meaning of art. I began to rethink the entire definition. The reason why the child in the centre of the image only has one eye visible portrays how much you have opened my eyes to the completely different world that surrounds me. I begin to see the world of art like I was spectating somebody else completely. I will never ever forget how I felt when I thought I finally understood what it means to be an artist. The quote, art lives on, means how many young people and artists that you have inspired. I am sure many children who have, you have taught will never let go of the beauty of art. So I hope this piece, which you can keep, will act as a thank you for making all of my art lessons so very special. I will never ever forget that. I will continue to love art, make it, respect and understand it for as long as I am able to create it. Many, many thanks. Now that just absolutely floored me when it came through the door because this particular student was so quiet, so unassuming, just knuckled down and got on with their work. And that just coming through the post two years after they'd left school was just, a wonderful affirmation, I suppose, that, I mean, I know that going to work every day makes a difference. It's why I do it. It's not to pay the mortgage. It's why I do it. Um, but just, it floored me. So being an art educator, being an artist, mingling with young children, sharing what you know makes such a difference and it's so important. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to another friend and colleague, Beatrice Barrett. Beatrice is currently a year five learner, student, pupil at Battiford C of E Primary School, which is in Murfield, which is all, uh, also in West Yorkshire. Over to you, B. Hi, uh, my name's B, and I'm gonna tell you about what I think and really what I really do and what I want for the future. So ever since I could pick up a pen, crayon or pencil, I have loved to create. My earliest memories were drawing big spiders and snails. I also remember being with my dad and making or drawing things with him. When I think of memories, so many of them, they are about drawing and painting, whether it's outside or inside. At school, I love the art lessons because I'm allowed to express myself. I love to do art at home as well. We visit, as a family, we visit the Hepworth Gallery and the Arch Sculpture Park a lot. It is very fun. I enjoy making little booklets and giving them to my friends as well. I love that all three of us like art, me, my mum and my dad. So it's something we can do together and share together. I like that I am named after Beatrix Potter, a magnificent artist who invented a Peter Rabbit. When I am older, I want to be an artist because I think it will be fun and magical for me. When I go up to my room, I, I draw in my new sketchbook and I draw something new every time. Even though I am 10, I have learned to print, paint, sculpt, draw, 
collage, build and make and create digital art, which I think is important because I can find out which of these things I want to explore more. I already keep changing my mind about what I want to be when I am older. I just know I would love it to be creative. Then I will love my job, which is very important. Like my mum and dad, they love their jobs, which is important to them. Without my artwork, singing, dancing and guitar playing, I really would not know what to do with my time. I am Beatrix Barrett and I love being an artist. If I can be an artist, you can be an artist too. Well, wow. uh, um, as I've been talking about what I like to do, these are the uh, little books I've made for my friends, and they're just like little um booklets that stretch out um like this, and um. I've just shown them in today and I'm just going to bring loads in tomorrow to give to my friends. And this is my sketchbook. It was supposed to be um, a writing book, but um, I just loved it. So these are some of my art that I've done. I've copied them off my dad, but still, um, it's my own piece of artwork. So all these... Um, I just love and the one of my best art art pieces that I've made. They are so beautiful, B, and thank you. And thank you for inviting everybody to be an artist. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Mandy and B, for that beautiful beginning to our blizzard of stories so in the spirit of a blizzard i'm now going to introduce to you um live for the tico live is an artist an anthropologist and an educator she's doing a three-year um phd placement at mcgill university in montreal and her middle year is a year in the amazonian forest in ecuador so over to you live and welcome Thank you, Penny. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, B. It's a very hard one to follow, but I will I will try my best. Thank you for the inspiration to and your call out for all of us to be to be artists. So I thought that today I could tell you a little bit about dreams and we could dream together into the world of the Amazon forest. We know of dreams as hopes and as fears, as things that we would like to get and that we imagine in our sleep when we go to bed. But what if, what if there was a place where dreams were as real as where you're standing now? The cup of tea you're holding is as true in this particular moment as it is in your dreams. What madness, what way of life would that be? What would it be like if you woke up and you went to your kitchen table with your family in the morning, with your friends, with your dog, if you live with one? And the first thing you did before you sat down on your laptop to write your emails, to get your admin done, to walk out, to go to your job, what would it happen if the first thing you did was to share your dreams with the people that you love? And what would happen if those dreams started crafting your life? For us, that's a dream, one of many. But there are people in this world that live that way. They're already crafting their entire daily experiences based on what they dream at night. For them, their dream space isn't a fantasy, isn't a false space. It is just as real as it is to be here with you on Zoom right now, as it is to be here in Montreal with this massive strange building behind me. I'm talking about the Sapra nation of Ecuador. The Sapra are a group, an indigenous group living nested in the Amazon forest by a beautiful river called the Conambe. There is 500 of them at least it's 500 humans. 
and a lot more animals and a lot more plants. And they live in dream, in life, in spirit, in earth, together. The Sapra are dreaming. And now, do I mean a dream in the dream space or do I mean a dream shared stories around a fire pit? Whatever. The Sapra are dreaming of an education project. It's based on writing down their oral histories into a curriculum, weaving it into the fabric of their daily life. The curriculum is then is then going to be brought to you, to each and every one of you, educators, artists, to Mandy, as much as to be, as much as to all of us, so that children and young people in schools, in art spaces, in activist groups, can start weaving the techniques of the forest into their daily life. And that will mean dreaming, that will mean making art, that will mean connecting to the very fabric of reality that the Sapra called the forest, that you and I call the imagination. So as a gift to all of us, I will invite you to do what the Sapra do tomorrow. Just go to bed tonight. Think of this space. and dream what you want tomorrow to be. Then when you wake up, share it with the people you love and let's make it happen together. Oh, so beautiful, Liv, so beautiful. Dreaming in the forest together, that's what we all need to do. Thank you so much. And that's a perfect segue into uh, my introduction to the wonderful Andrew Amundsen. So Andrew is a Berlin-based artist and filmmaker working with Alafia Eliasson and Vin Vendors and obviously with Forest of Imagination in Bath, UK. But Andrew's calling in today from Berlin. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Liv. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Liv, Mandy, everyone here. I'm so inspired and I find that my story is evolving in this very moment, you know, from hearing Mandy talk about her experience and, and also Beatrix in the art room. All of a sudden, I remember the story of being in my art room and having a teacher come up to me and say, Andrew, that's so beautiful. And I felt so great. And then she went to the next kid and said, oh, that's so beautiful. And she went around the room and I realized in that moment that there is no comparison, it's all beautiful. And so to, to hear these stories and then also to think about weaving these dreams, I shared, okay, one last thing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just absolutely floored. And I, be, I believe that I'm really at the beginning of, of a dream that is that I'm finding the importance of as I move forward. And that is to, to be uh, like you all, uh, which is to be an activist for arts and the, I have to collect myself for a second. The, the slide that I shared was the forest because that I'm deeply connected to it. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest United States in and amongst the old growth forests. And <clears throat> what I learned, I learned from the forest. I learned about physics from falling from a tree. I learned you know, the density of things and my own place in the world from the forest. And it feels like such a special and specific connection that only I have. But the thing that's so wonderful about the forest is that we all have it. <clears throat> and I think that not only do we just share so much of our DNA with the trees and the forest, um, and even if we don't have the experience of being in the forest, as soon as we see it, as soon as we are in it, we are connected in, in, a, in a way that is so important. And my story for why I'm here today comes through an invitation I got from Penny who introduced me and that was to draw myself as a tree. And I, you know, and it just goes to say, you're, you're never too old to learn something new, especially about yourself. And, <clears throat> the tree wasn't any specific tree, but it had 
long branching arms that were at the right height that children could climb. And then they would shoot down into the ground and then come back up and create more forests. And where is this going? <laughs> I had an idea, an imagine if moment, um, like Sir Ken Robinson, you know, challenged us all to do to to take the things, the life that we take for granted and, and challenge it with this idea of finishing the sentence, imagine if. And one time here in Berlin, I was standing underneath the Christmas tree at the Brandenburg Gate, and I was overwhelmed by both the tree's beauty, but also a deep sense of sadness for the loss of that tree. And I had this imagine if moment, like, what if we didn't have to cut it down? What if we could plant a thousand trees instead of that? And so I started to create this idea that I didn't know where it was going to go. But when I met Penny and I got to draw myself as a tree and I heard about the forest of imagination in Bath, I thought, this is, this is the this is the component to the idea that is the most important, which is the educational one, the one that that reaches <clears throat> that reaches out and connects to others. So we've been developing that, and what the idea has become, it's so different than I could have ever imagined. You know, I was developing it for Rockefeller Center in New York, and that doesn't go where I thought it would go. It didn't go. Where it did go, it went to the city of Bath into the Egg Theater, which is home to a, a radical space for re, you know, for for reimagining education um, through School Without Walls. And, and I just got so inspired by these ideas. And the Living Tree then became what I would call, you know, which I had imagined an art installation became an open classroom, a space for liberated learning. And I could never have thought I, um, it would be this. And the challenge was to bring a forest inside a theater. And when we built this together, a co-creation with the creative community coming together to make this space, um, the real joy came when schools got to come into this space where there are the sounds and the smells of the forest and the green and, and also the forest out of context uh, was so powerful and we developed it further in the next year, offering reflections with mirror mazes. And it's been such a joy to be a part of. But the one and final quick story that I wanted to share with everyone is that, it, and the most meaning that has come from it for this space of liberated learning was I was there just um, for the last installation and a mother came up to me and she said, uh, I was here last year with my daughter who is special needs. And she's not able to sit in a classroom, but in the installation or in this space, she was able to sit quietly for an hour and just to be in that space. And what I love about your, the words that you've shared earlier, that it is for everyone, the forest is for everyone. These opportunities need to be for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Fantastic. Your story is such a powerful example of embodied learning and the, the, the kind of energy of embodied learning. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to introduce next, I'd like to welcome Ben Dixon, whose research around skateboarding is forming the basis of his PhD in arts practice and learning at Goldsmiths where Ben uses practice-based and anthropological lens as a, as a multimodal exploration or a way of exploring urban development. Um, he's using sound recording and casting techniques as research tools. So Ben's research is based on the City Mill Skate Project in East London. And Ben was part of a team delivering a summer school for 10 to 14 year olds during two weeks in August. <clears throat> and Ben's observations during that two weeks have informed this story. So welcome, Ben. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today. And thanks to all the other speakers for their contributions too. Um, I'm Ben Dixon, an artist, researcher and skateboarder based at Goldsmiths. And today I want to be, uh, I'll be sharing a story of a young person who surprised me with their own playful act of resistance that reaffirmed my faith in the disruptive power of skateboarding. 
So earlier this year, as Esther said, I helped to facilitate some skateboarding and media workshops on behalf of City Mill Skate as part of the Here East Summer School, which is where I met, uh, where I met this young person. Uh, I've offered, uh, opted to keep their name out of the story for reasons which will become clear later on. Um, so I think skateboarding is going through a particularly interesting time right now. As an anthropologist, I'm curious about the cultural meanings of skateboarding and how these change over time. What sort of connotations does it bring up for people? Maybe it's the Olympics, maybe it's art and fashion. Some of you might have heard of various skateboarding philanthropy groups, grassroots organizations who do great work with marginalized people in the skateboard community or who use skateboarding as an educational tool. As we know, this wasn't always the case. Skateboarding has always had a strong countercultural element to it. And even as little as a decade ago, it would be just as likely for people to associate it with things like petty crime, vandalism, and general delinquency. In fact, there was a time when academics were suggesting that skateboarding is implicitly anti-capitalist insofar as it resists hierarchy and performatively critiques the notion of private property through its subversive reappropriation of urban space. This is the suggestion of architectural historian Ian Borden in his much cited book, Skateboarding in the City. So my own research focuses on sound and listening in skateboarding, particularly on sound as a potential sort of disruption of urban space. I'm interested in how and perhaps whether skateboarding can hold on to some of this subversive critique, which I think can be quite fruitful in the, space, in the face of the growth and expansion that we're seeing to stay in summer school uh, in, in skateboarding. So it's the first day of a new week at the Heary Summer School. There's a group of new young people this week and they're a little, a little nervous, a little restless, stood in a queue waiting for the day to begin. One of them I notice has brought his own skateboard from home and he quickly gets bored of queuing and starts skating around nearby. So I go over and say hello and he's an absolute bundle of energy. Like he is buzzing to be here. The first thing that he notices is my hat, which is the same brand as his. And he's uh, at pains to tell me that he won his hat at a skateboard competition for doing the best trick or something along those lines. Um, so I, as I mentioned, the workshops were delivered on behalf of City Mill Skate, which is a skate space on the Olympic Park, which used a participatory approach to the design in order to make the site as accessible and welcoming to as many different people as possible. Uh, just a little side note, the inauguration of the site was yesterday and it was a huge success. So big congratulations to Esther and the City Mill team. It's definitely in order. Um, so yeah, throughout the week of summer school, we are trying to get the young people to start thinking about these ideas which are central to City Mill. So accessibility in skate spaces, regardless of ability level, representation in skateboarding and so on. One of the things which is really emphasized in the skateboarding lessons is the importance of listening in skate spaces. So sound is a huge part of how skateboarders orient themselves in space and how they share space with others. So we would focus on listening in order to hear where other skaters are in relation to you in order to avoid collisions and to avoid cutting one another off in the space. So it was really interesting to watch this young person's progression throughout the week. They went from quite a boisterous, individualistic, competitive style of skating to a much more considerate, attuned and careful approach, which still made the most out of the space, but allowed space for others around him to also practice their own skating as well. This was really great to see, um, a brilliant kind of development to watch happening. But as I sort of left the summer school, I, I was curious about how this young person's skate progression would go if they would continue to skate or if they would continue to enjoy skateboarding in the same way. Um, kind of wondering whether in this instruction to listen, it would almost take the edge off skateboarding. Like in some ways you've got this cool, loud sort of punk thing and all of a sudden you're being told to listen. Um, in a way it could sort of sound a bit like a teacher saying, you know, listen up, follow the rules, um, something along those lines. So I hope that the nuances of this listening practice had sort of come through in a positive way and not been transformed into this more didactic sort of command of listen up. 
Uh, thankfully, I wasn't left wondering for too long. I've been expecting to see this person at the City Mill opening um, a couple of weeks back, but this was postponed due to the Queen's funeral. So the City Mill site remained closed to skaters, locked up behind metal fencing, uh, completely inaccessible for the time being. I did run into him a few days later though, at a skate jam at Hackney Bumps, which is another community skate space in East London. So he comes over, he's got the same hat on that he had on in the summer school. Um, and he, he says hello and we have a little chat for a bit. And then there's sort of a little dip in the conversation and I can see him searching for something to say next. And he sort of leans in in this uh, conspiratorial tone and he goes, have you skated at City Mill yet? Um, so it turned out that while I'd been wondering about whether this person was being too considerate, too well-behaved of a skater, they'd been out hopping fences and breaking into private property, uh, a core practice of any self-respecting skater, of course. So yeah, that's the thought that I'd like to close on. Um, I've recently heard it said in debates around skating that um, skateboarding will change the Olympics more than uh, the Olympics could ever change skating. And now I have faith that skateboarding will change the Olympic park more than the park will change it. Thanks for your time. Oh, Ben, that was so wonderful. It's my absolute pleasure to be the one who gets to thank you for that story and, and so amazing to listen. I'm always inspired to try and get back on a skateboard when I meet and I took catch up with Esther, but now I'm almost inspired again, except for probably won't, but it is brilliant. I love I love hearing skateboarding stories and that's such a uh, such a touching story. Thank you. Um, it is my great pleasure now to introduce my colleague Hilary Cox Condren who um, I've had the privilege of working with for a number of years. And um, Hilary's practice as a community artist, creative producer and local politician has been shaped through activism or maybe vice versa, she says, with social and environmental justice at its heart, exploring, sharing and celebrating creativity, culture, stories, heritage and the natural environment. Her work nurtures a sense of place and identity imagination and exploration, building relationships and vision and empowering long-term positive change. Over to you, Hilary. Thank you, thanks Ruth. And thank you everybody, lovely to be here. So I'm in Cambridge at the moment, but I'm starting this in Johannesburg in 1995. Um, Nelson Mandela had just become president um, and, and it was a very exciting time with buzzing with creative energy. And I was there painting murals. I became, uh, he was nine and living on the street. He and his friends would come and join me to paint and chat during the day. And in the evening I'd cook rice and we'd sit in the market and make clay beads together. And we set up a stool to sell them. But it wasn't unusual that when sitting on a curb one evening, a man started to shout abuse at them, telling them, telling them that they were nothing that their lives were worthless. One of the boys waited until there was a break, looked the man in the eye and said, I am not worthless. I made this today. And he opened his hand to reveal one of the beads. And I had no idea that that's what we were doing. I thought that we were just having fun and looking out for each other. And it was an epiphany. And out of this, that out of this space, of liberation and support, of infinite wonkiness and rejected hierarchy, I found my greatest teachers who showed me the um, transformative power of creativity. And so back home to Cambridge, a city of high walls and high art. And whilst I disagree that there are hard to reach communities, there is definitely hard to reach art, hard to reach culture and hard to reach nature. So I continue my practice and I venture out with children using art, creativity, storytelling and exploration to discover the awe on our doorsteps, slowing down to use all of our senses, feeling the breeze on our faces and fierce spirit in our hearts. And more and more, I think of myself less of an artist and more of a seeker of unruly artscape, uh, artscapes and a maker of space. It feels so wild, it's not like I'm going into nature, it's like I am nature. I am a clover fox, rainbow leopard, a turquoise dream, a dream paranoid, a, a dream snake pyramid. 
It doesn't seem fair that we hurt nature. Trees were there first and they can't fight back. I am a chalk stream. I have a right to be here. And we connect to our streams, to our forests, to unchanged Fenland landscapes and give thanks to the Fen Tigers resistance group who once fought for this land. And like the Tigers who devised football tournaments so that they could gather, plan and fill the trenches that were draining the common land, so too we take our simple tools of creativity and travel forests and fields and unruly landscapes using art, stories and imagination to break down our barriers, take risks and find threads in resonance and resistance. Being in the hail hurricane felt like war World War III. It tickled and pierced into my skin. We laughed and ran and shouted. I begged for it not to stop. And conversations change. Children start to excitedly tell me how art opens their brains, connects them and makes them happy. And about the ants, spiders, wood lice, bees and butterflies they'd spotted at the weekend. Small everyday observations and joy. A moth on the window ledge as they pulled back the curtains, finding a feather drawing in a field. Art in nature isn't really art, said Malik. It's the core of the earth. Ah, like the mycelium beneath us that connects and communicates, just as we nurture the creativity at the core of us and stimulate the deep rooted connections as the forest grows richer and stronger. Sometimes I don't want to say words, but art helps me find them, even if I never show my art to anyone else. The simple truth is these children do not have a place they feel they can go out into in the community where they feel safe, said a therapeutic practitioner that I was working alongside. Many have regularly spoken about death, but have said that for reasons they do not know, they feel happy creating outside. Tom was asked why he was running and woohooing around the school field. I told Hilary I want to be an artist when I'm older, and she told me that I am an artist already, he said before running off again, arms flapping, big grin. And we know that art for wellbeing is not simply about feeling happy. It is about connecting to all of our emotions, connecting to our environment, unraveling difficult concepts and conversations, giving agency and hope and sparking our imaginations to be able to visualize the changes we need to make for a better future. But it is also about embracing being beautifully different and running wildly in communally crafted, liberated spaces with arms flapping and woo-hooing at the top of our voices. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary to start with a bead and then to open up to such profound connections between art and nature um, and, and I love that idea that it's both resistant but also safe as a space at the same time um, thank you very much um, I now have the pleasure to welcome Jonathan Beecroft Jonathan is an artist and Forgive me, Jonathan, I want to call you a philosophical educationalist, um, if I may. I'm delighted to have met Jonathan um, when he came as a student on the MA Arts and Learning at Goldsmiths. It's Jonathan's second MA, following an art history and philosophy course that he'd done previously. Currently, Jonathan is in a role as a teaching assistant in London at Phoenix Primary and Secondary School for Young People with Autism. In this context, Jonathan has been able, with the agreement of the school, to create artwork with the children in his class that attunes to the ecology of sensory experiences that are prevalent in an environment full of new autistic neurodiversity. So welcome, Jonathan. Thanks, Esther. It was a very introduction, much appreciated. Um, so I've written a story um, or a summary of my work at Phoenix mm -hmm. and I hope you don't mind uh, for brevity I'm just going to cut out the beginning and we'll start in the middle because why not um, except I'm going to retain one sentence from my first large paragraph which is I had been knitting scarves with my fingers 
was assisted in thinking through this via my last meetings with my grandma before she passed away last year. I mentioned that I'd been reading about the original meaning of the term gossip, an old noun for a community group of solidarity between women, sharing, exchanging and supporting each other in many aspects of life. The type of place I'd imagine different textile stitches and patterns were shared, transformed and grown until, or rather, in spite of the... Hang on, Jonathan, we've lost you. You've gone on to mute. I'm back. Someone muted me. It's all right. I'm back. Uh, sharing, exchanging and supporting each other in many aspects of life. The type of place I'd imagine different textile stitches and patterns were shared, transformed and grown until or rather in spite of the eventual mutation of the term into casual and unconstrained chit chat via the witch trials and literal, you might say, demonization of women. My nan, to be fair, was doolally in her last few years for at least half of each day, and she recalled in our discussion a journey she'd taken up Pendle Hill with said witches. I must mention I chose to discuss this with nan, as she was from Colne, near Pendle Hill in Lancashire, the site of the UK's most infamous witch trials. Further confirmation of a passing between sharing, weaving, knitting and threading, persisting into the present, was provided when coming around my nan in her last hours, where her daughters, my mum and auntie, passed between them, a small knitted blue patch of wool they'd found in her room, unfinished and with the needle still attached, between them continuing, waiting, listening and watching. I felt comforted and lucky to participate in this circle. The sites of education present a place for community building, for making visible these social threads in, an, in a way not dissimilar to this, beyond the family within the community, via perhaps similar resistant practices of material experiment, care, play and collaboration in relation further to unique communities and their capacity for the expression and construction of communally recognized problems that communicate the intersecting and joining of differing, of differing needs. Working in schools, I've always felt privileged to enter these places of community and have sought to complement, deepen and differentiate learning with students where possible. I had not knowingly worked with students with high level autism prior to arriving at Phoenix but occasionally with children with special educational need within mainstream inclusive and alternative school settings. The first students with an ASD diagnosis I encountered told me that maybe their body is tingling or else wanted to turn over the varying merits of different Windows operating systems and the dreaded imminent closure of Microsoft support for those older systems, or that the capital of Burkina Faso is Ugadugu, or that the school gates and fences look like a prison. The teenagers in the class that I work with at Phoenix are commonly referred to, and this is a reductive description, as nonverbal, or lacking to differing degrees the capacity for verbal communication. This designation of lack and of de deficit is persistent and damaging. Intelligence is beyond verbal language and communication is broader than linguistic dexterity. Behaviour communicates and materials do too. Over a period of one or two months, I learned to be with these children about their interests, preferences and needs and how best to support them in and around the classroom and school. The school uses a system of working for sensory rewards of various kinds to incentivize learning. I wondered if it were useful as a goal to make the learning itself the reward through appealing to children's interests in designing activities for them. Some children need more coercion than others, some require none at all. For the latter, joy with the everyday or ordinary materials of learning carry over into regulation and relaxation stages of lessons in the day, developing from out of the available equipment or materials granted to them opportunity to continue playing with, enjoying and developing the sensory potential of these learning materials, such as paper, glue, scissors and so on. One student cuts paper incessantly into ever refined and diminishing pieces. Another tears and or cuts paper, then throws pieces into the air, like he's showing money off to the sky or dealing cards to God, perhaps to achieve the greatest flotation effect over the longest period of time, or at least so it seems to me. Some others work more for a specific reward seemingly unrelated to ordinary learning materials such as paper, whether this be a go on the iPad or computer or a movement break outside of the classroom, they are enjoying, experimenting, repeating and transforming similarly their media exhibiting skill, learning and creativity in doing so. One manipulates numerous media players across internet explorer tabs, playing and repeating parts from their favorite films and episodes. Or another, finding spaces around the school ground to conduct experiments with found or pilfered materials, 
combining them with spit to entangle through rolling together and painting arcs with the finger using these various bits and phlegm before moving on to do the same, but differently in some other in-between or else inconvenient thoroughfare or corner place. These are some examples of student-led creativity in the class of 15 year olds that I landed in that for me constituted forms of creative research, reiterative investigation into what works under variable conditions, into materials and their capacities of construction in, and expression aligned with and by the body, processes from which I learned and combined in appropriations of them in my own personal experiments as an artist, some of which circled round into working with many handmade sketchbooks sewn at the spine that between us could place this material dialogue, fixing some materials from it onto its pages. The joys of cutting, gluing, poking, piercing, taping, scribbling, scratching, spitting, sucking, and so forth. I delivered three lessons to this class, art lessons. The first one presented with the title Making with Jonathan, and then the better Making Together. Each session attempted to appeal as broadly as possible to these pre-existing creative skills achieved through endless repetition and growth through play, drawing on specific activities, processes and material qualities that students appeared to like. So in each, working upon a canvas placed on the ground around which we sat on the floor as a team of educators and children together to collaborate, we in one painted a summer painting. I'd strewn summery flowers over the canvas for inspiration and ambience. The first response to the task was from a child who started to paint with the flowers despite the available brushes. I had not even thought of this. In another lesson, we collaged together using a variety of materials from art and kids' magazines to newspapers and other more random paper materials. This was to work on our collaboration via exchange, passing and swapping pieces, dividing labor according to each's whim and will, while building upon the cross-curricular skills that students use at Phoenix School across subjects, such as cutting and sticking, as they do to build statements, sentences, and questions with semantic chunks. The writing presents a too difficult task. In the other, we drew around our bodies, mapping our spatial relations on the floor while practicing bodily awareness and getting really stuck into charcoal mark making and our charcoal mark making similarly getting onto us, on our hands, our clothes, and our faces. These lessons I delivered attempted to build into the skills of autistic stimming or self-stimulating behavior, both and or either for regulation and sensory enjoyment, emerging from each student's engagement with the world, with school, with the available objects, processes, and materials, and entangling with their creative bodily capacity for coping with the diverse and difficult conditions of perception and regulation that people on the autism spectrum experience. These so-called repetitive actions that, however, produce motor neuronal dexterity, proprioceptive practice and skill, which students achieve in seeking to orient themselves in the world, and which as teachers and teaching assistants, we encourage students to do independently. As creative research and materially based bodily entangled practices, in each instance, a unique quality and movement between body, material, thought and idea is produced. For the final exhibition for our MA, I attempted to document in artworks my own learning process as a result of being exposed to these creative children and working with them, of designing art lessons for them, and the intermingling of our interests in that process. While we produced three gorgeous canvases in different media, paint, collage, and charcoal, and a couple of collaborative small sketchbooks, I wanted to make something of my own. I had been supplying children who cut and tear paper with old art magazines I had and didn't particularly covet, wondering to what extent the imagery, historical, modern and contemporary works of art, adverts and so forth, did or did not appeal to them or alter the process. As clearing these away was a prerogative of the children and their developing independence, I couldn't redirect these waste materials from the bin if I tried, and I did. I instead would scramble around on the floor when a moment presented and collect the best bits. I then sewed these together. After an envelope of bits had been filled, over the course of a week or two weeks or a few days. Eventually suspending and holding together these pieces so that they might be looked at, each representing a duration and intensity in time of my time working with these students. As such, I think they mark a process of exchange of circulating skills via a dialogue with material using what is to hand, cheap or readily available. A shared knowledge produced from out of this particular encounter. 
not the emergence of artistic insight as in a divine flash from elsewhere, but a deepening, combining, overlaying, collaging and threading of different rhythms where in the middle of the hubbub, if we listen and look, we are all learners and teachers. Wow, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, you presented such an evocative picture of your making together and the deep value of that making for you and, and everyone involved in the process of the students. And I'm absolutely buzzing from all of these stories. And um, so I'm a bit sad, but also delighted to introduce our last uh, storyteller. Let me just get Kim's image up here. I'm really excited to introduce Kim Zanti. Kim is a dear friend and a colleague whose professional and personal practice is anchored in creativity and story. After many years working in the Los Angeles arts and culture sector, primarily in theater, she served as the associate director of the Centers for Research on Creativity. In this role, Kim investigated how arts-led learning supports children and young people's imagination and creativity in the United States and internationally. Now, Kim applies her rich expertise as a creativity consultant with communities in California and beyond. She teaches classes, facilitates creative explorations, and tells stories through film and word. She's currently directing a documentary on the Alcamal Arts Festival in Mexico, and as of two days ago, she completed a draft of her debut novel. We're so lucky to have you here, Kim, and I'm very delighted to hear about where and how you're cultivating spaces for liberated learning. Thank you so much, Gabby, for that introduction and to everybody for having me here. It's quite an inspiring group and I'm ready to move to England and uh, play in all these spaces. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so creativity and community uh, have been two guiding themes of my professional and personal and artistic life. And so after many years immersed in these topics, I started a creativity lab in my own backyard. And I started with the question of um, what would it look like if a community, my community of Topanga, California, a small community, uh, strengthened itself by developing its own resources for imaginative learning or liberated learning. And I started, um, I started by uh, setting up three makeshift tables and a random assortment of uh, pieces of pottery and tiny statues and beads and fabric swatches and things like that, that I had collected over the years myself for mixed media pieces but also from the property where um, sort of an original liberated learner, my landlord, um, who he believes that the creativity in Topanga comes up out of the ground. So he just would throw random little bits and bobs of things around um, and leave them uh, just to kind of conjure the spirits of creativity. And, um, and that was really amazing to find all these things, but it was also kind of the Virgo in me was like, well, I think I need to organize these little pieces and put them in bins in the shed, which is what I did and where they were. Um, but then I had that desire to share um, uh, what was going on on the property and also just to explore that question. What if we had our own creativity lab um, in our neighborhood in Topanga. So, so I started small and I asked two young mothers on my street to come with their boys. Uh, I believe they were age six and eight um, to come and play. And I spread all those um, assorted items uh, out. And um, I had two requirements. Uh, one that the mom stayed with their sons and played together and that they brought something to share so that when they left and the materials they had used would be replenished. Uh, schedules didn't allow for them to come to play together, the boys and the moms, so they came separately, um, each uh, for about 40 to 45 minutes uh, and well, three consecutive weeks. And I stayed nearby, uh, but out of their way. 
And I provided tape and glue and crayons and paint and brushes and water and scissors. Um, and the researcher in me wanted to ask pre and post questions, but I just let it happen. I resisted the urge to do that. I just really wanted to see in this unruly space, in this unmanaged space, what it would be like for them to just come and play. Uh, and what I found is that they loved playing together, the moms and their sons, outdoors, uninterrupted, and without rules. Um, the younger boy, Aspen, uh, he made a small sculpture out of a, 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 a metal tin with a playing card and a feather and a piece of twine and crayon. And the older boy made uh, bumpers for his bicycle. And in this image that you uh, saw, uh, he had um, taken apart wire baskets, uh, a, a, a hanging basket for vegetables uh, and dis disassembled it and started the, using that as the um, as bumpers for his bicycle. And then he covered that uh, those those round baskets in aluminum or um, aluminium, I guess, and uh, and um, and and then festooned the tops of those with tiny metal planets that were just laying around. Uh, and then he covered those in aluminum too. So uh, his dad helped. His dad had come, and that's his dad in the image. Uh, he came to. Um, uh, help him attach the bumpers to his bike. And um, so I don't know how long the bumpers stayed on the bike, but really what mattered is that uh, Ryder and his mom and his dad, uh, they played and they problem solved and they discovered together. So I really loved what I heard and I observed and it motivated me to transform the shed where I had put the bin with all the, the, the assorted items into a working studio. And I needed a playmate. I needed someone to bounce ideas off of and really quite frankly, to liberate my own creativity. So um, a lot of names went through my head and left and, um, and then uh, one name stayed and that was uh, the name of Joe. Uh, a young colleague from my local literary community. Um, I knew Joe to be uh, a very independent thinker, imaginative thinker, open-minded, open-hearted. And so he came and he helped me uh, transform this shed into a working studio. And we did that by exploring, by experimenting um, and figuring out how to move um, uh, working spaces around with storage spaces. Uh, and to start that process that um, we decided first, to, let's walk, let's walk in the hills. So we walked to a very popular spot called Eagle Rock that um, two months prior had been completely engulfed in flames and my neighborhood had been evacuated. Um, and um, and when Joe and I went, I hadn't seen it yet up close. Uh, it was extremely emotional to walk through that burnt charred landscape down to the ground. Um, and, and while we were walking, Joe was collecting twigs. And when we got back home, he began to use the twigs as charcoals. Uh, and, and so um, in the midst of our transformation of the shed, he was using them to make art. And it was a really uh, beautiful way of um, connecting with the natural world that we live in and of bringing it into that space of, of liberated learning. So uh, after we completed the transformation of the, the, the um, shed into the studio, uh, we christened it the Shedio. And then, and then Joe moved to New York City, where he is today, uh, while I received funding, and Gabby mentioned the documentary. Um, this was in January of this year. I had funding to um, direct a, a, and make a short documentary uh, in a small pueblo on the Yucatan Peninsula uh, that had invited 
um, more than 100 artists to come and paint their town, uh, mural artists, and not in, in a separate industrial park or arts district, but to literally paint their homes, their schools, the medical center, the water tower, um, their shops, uh, the bridge that separated the beach side of the Pueblo to the uh, jungle side, um, it's and the library. I mean, there were just everything. There were artists from all over the world there. And I needed a producer and I needed someone who was sensitive to the um, to the incredibly diverse environment that we were walking into um, and a unique community, a very loving community. And again, after many names came to my mind and left, um, one stayed and that was Joe. And I asked him, would you come to Akamala as my line producer? And um, he said, I, I'm moving to New York and, and I don't know, and I have to let you know. And so that night he called me and said, no, I would love to go. I would love to go. And so we did. And the experience was beyond my wildest dreams of doing something with someone that was novel to us both. Neither of us had made a film before uh, and had been in the positions we were in. And we led a team um, through a shoot that was just the most beautiful collection of stories and images. And, and the trailer is now in process and the, and the um, short documentary should be finished by the end of January. So the upshot of my story is that um, liberated learning begets liberated learners who liberate themselves and others developing those pockets of resistance to old conventions that can grow into interconnected webs of resilient, joyful, and hopeful spaces where creativity thrives. So thank you. Wow, Kim, what a way to wrap up our speakers, our <laughs> storytellers. Thank you so much. I'm struck by this image of taking something burned and charred, which I think we all come across in different ways around our world and turning it into charcoal to make art. I mean, what a great image for that idea of the possibility of makeshift materials allowing creativity to grow out of the ground. Just wonderful. Thank you. So, we're now going to invite Rob um, Hopkins to speak. Rob is the co-founder of Transition Towns Totnes and the Transition Network, which is part of Transition Together, an international movement of communities that are coming together to reimagine and rebuild a more equal, sustainable and democratic future. Rob is also the author of What Is of To What If, which Ruth held up at the beginning um, and has the wonderful role of holding the imagination thread for transition together. So tonight we've asked and invited Rob to weave his own imagination thread through our stories and to help Rob do that what I'd like to invite us to do just for one moment for one minute is to imagine that we are all sitting now around the fire watching the snowflakes from our blizzard settle all around us, wrapping us all in a gentle glowing blanket that helps us feel safe just for this moment right now. And Rob, when you are ready, I'll let you end the pause to begin your thread. Yeah, well, thank thank you so much, everybody. That was that was just beautiful, and I feel I, I feel so nourished by that because so much of the work that I do is kind of being the one trying to bring the imagination into spaces where it has long since kind of desiccated or been shoved into a cupboard or put in the where we must get round to that sometime box, and it's just sort of it's there sort of slowly uh, giving up the will to live. And my role is to kind of go in and try and 
perk it up and blow and sort of blow those embers you know and so I feel like rather than rather than a blizzard of stories it's felt a bit like a kind of a jacuzzi of, of stories it's felt really just so delightfully restorative and healing and uh, really really enjoyable and um and and it's always so lovely to be part of something with Cambridge curiosity and imagination involved I, I so love um when I was researching the book actually coming across the work that, that they do has been one of the was one of the most the best discoveries really of that whole process um so I guess I, I have just a few reflections that I had. You know, I, I, I'm really one of those kids like Mandy talked about for whom when I discovered the art room in school, all of a sudden I, I, I kind of came home, really. It was the place where I could uh, find myself and get away from everything else and learn to learn to be really creative and and uh, and it's still a really important part of 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 me and what I do, and I loved it when she talked about working in a space with art dripping off the walls, and uh, uh, it was just yeah I, I, that was really very beautiful and to hear from Beatrix as well, and it was so kind of her to share the work that she's been doing and uh, her drawings and the things that she makes. And it really took me back to me at that age, which is up in my bedroom, sticking things together and drawing and painting. And, and um, when Livia was talking about the forest and about dreams, it really reminded me, there's an amazing book, Angela Carter, who I think is one of the greatest sort of English uh, writers, wrote a book called The Infernal Desire Machines of Dr. Hoffman, where, um, uh, where Dr. Hoffman invented a machine that, that, that would make people's uh, dreams come alive. And it's a, the most mad book. But um, I, uh, I love that idea that we, that, that, that we connect with our dreams in that kind of a way. And um, yeah, and I loved Andrew talking about the forest and, and the, the, what, what so much, but I'm, as a permaculture teacher, by, by training, that's what I did for a long time. Bill Mollison, who was one of the creators of permaculture, used to say, if we lose the universities, we lose nothing. And if we lose the forests, we lose everything. And uh, we learn so, so, so much there. And uh, my, um, I, I appreciated what he said about falling out of a tree. My son Finn fell out of a tree uh, when, uh, when he was about seven and broke his arm. And I read research recently that said, if you've fallen out of a tree, before the age of 13 when you're 18 it makes you so much better at taking risks and uh so i again that really brought the forest we've had a few speakers who've really brought the forest right into the center of this conversation um yeah and the 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 the, the um the forests as spaces for liberated learning fantastic and um, skateboarding uh, sorry, I was going to shut the door because someone's blending some soup. Um, yeah, and, and Hillary talking about discovering the aura doorstep. And Jonathan talking about working, working with kids yeah. in this way has just been glorious. Uh, and how we're all learners and we're all teachers. Oh, someone on the phone. Hello. Um, yeah, and I'm going to create a shedio in my garden. I think when I get back. So I've, I've, I've. This has been just such a beautiful sort of soul food and creative stimulation, and um, it seems so heartbreaking to me that uh, you know I'm speaking to you in Belgium, and I, and I was in France the other day, and 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 in France if you can believe it, the education system is even more uh, crushing to the imagination than the education system we have in the UK. And there's this whole sort of movement of, of, uh, of parents who are basically just taking their kids out of school in droves and starting new kind of experimental projects and different systems. But it seems like the mainstream system has no inbuilt ability to reflect on that and to, uh, and to absorb that feedback and actually change what it does. Because as we enter, as, as we enter this time of uh, the climate and ecological emergency, I think it's cultivating imagination in our education system that's the most important and precious 
uh, uh, thing that we can do and education systems should be primarily focused on, on the cultivation of the imagination, particularly in the UK where 20% of our, of our economy is the creative sector, but actually by, by um, uh, uh, in spite of the education system really rather than being nurtured by it. So um, I'm a huge believer in creating spaces of liberated learning thank you all so 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 much for what you do I, f I feel so fed and nourished and inspired by this evening and thank you for inviting me to come along and and, and, and say this and just the very last thing i want to say is i was yesterday in utrecht in uh, in holland and i went there because i wanted to i'm doing a project working with uh, an electronic music artist and uh, who makes amazing ambient electronic music. And we're doing a project together called Field Recordings from the Future, where I go and visit places and I record where the, 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 uh, an, an element of what a low carbon future needs to be like. And then I go and record them. And then I and then he builds tracks based around them, based on the idea that we need, as Rilke said, that Rilke said that the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And that's what we try and do with that. So I just spent a blissful morning recording the bicycle rush hour, which is the biggest bicycle rush hour in Europe. And uh, it was just absolutely incredible to be in a city with 30,000 uh, bicycle parking spaces and uh, and bike parks. Uh, there's one bicycle park that accommodates about 18,000 bicycles in the centre of the city. It's just absolutely insane. And uh, so I feel like I've just been to the future and I've just come back from the low carbon future. And uh, there was the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington. There was this amazing T-shirt, which I love, which said, I've been to the future. We won. And so what I try and do with my work is that I've been to the future, we won, and I keep trying to go to the future and bring things back from that future, things like it, things that are more precious than gold, because they show us that, that we won and how we did it and what, it's, and what it's like when we actually get there. And all the stuff that we've heard tonight is so, uh, is so beautifully um, part of that. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you so much for helping us all imagine those hopeful futures. And I think what we've all experienced tonight are these beautiful examples, this collection of spaces of liberated learning and these invitations to do things differently together. And, and we've witnessed this um, creativity and imagination in the room. So yes, Kim, everybody needs a a shedio. So I'm going to hand over to Esther for the last words, but thank you so much, everyone. It's been absolutely inspiring, really inspiring. Esther. Thank you. Um, yes, my huge thanks again. I, I think my last word would just be about these spaces that we all are creating for liberated learning to take place. They're created through the energy that we put out into the world. And that energy, as we've heard through these wonderful stories, is to do with empathy, care, imagination, things that have a power that the economic debates that seem to be controlling our world at the moment can't hear. And we need to keep putting that energy into the world because it makes an enormous difference. Thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their stories. And let's hope we all step a little lighter as a result of coming together. Um, we hope to do something similar again in the future. And we would love to see you all back in this space. Thank you all.